I've been involved with the oceans my whole adult life. In college, I was already a diving instructor, and when I got into marine geology, or geology in general, I was fascinated that sea level changed up and down three or 400 feet with each ice age. And I studied that in what was called paleogeology. And then when I was diving in the Bahamas and elsewhere, in clear water and on a vertical face, and could look for ancient shorelines that were now one and 200 feet underwater, it tied it in all, made it very real. I never thought that sea level would change in my lifetime, because normally the, the rise and fall of sea level was on a thousands of years, actually a 100,000 year cycle. So it was, it was fascinating, but sea level wouldn't change in our lifetime. And now we're in an era when sea level is changing. Streets are flooding that didn't used to flood. They're putting pumps in Miami Beach to get salt water off the streets. And all over the world, extreme high tides are reaching farther and further inland than they ever did before. The ocean level is seven or eight inches higher globally as an average, but that ranges from four inches in Los Angeles to 12 inches in Miami and to 46 inches in New Orleans. Heights of sea level change because land moves up and down too. This is fascinating and complex, but I like to make it simple. And it, the dots all do connect. And strangely, sea level is something that's really quite easy to understand, but it's different than storms and extreme tides, although it will make them worse. But sea level rise is locked in, as I explained, because the ice sheets are melting. Glaciers in Greenland and Antarctica are melting and will continue to melt. We need to understand what's happened. This planet's changing. And there is an analogy to our human health public health and how this can affect us. And it's all part of the holistic picture that I think this conference has done a great job to showcase. So sea level rise, there's, let's say, three different time frames to think of this. What's happening now? Well, right now, streets are flooding that didn't used to flood. And when we have an extreme high tide, which is the alignment of the moon and the planets, that makes the tidal high of the day even higher every 28 days and in certain, certain months of the year even more strong that that's happening worse, and that's why streets are flooding that didn't used to flood. That also means that when a storm comes to a certain area, whether, whatever storm, that as the base gets raised, that the effect of the storm will get raised, and therefore further inland. So that's happening now, from place to place, that we're seeing effects already. Over the next 20 years, we might get a few more inches of sea level rise. Not enough to make a huge difference, but enough to get our attention that something's changing because the sea level determines the shoreline. We tend to think of it as permanent because for a few thousand years it hasn't changed much. But by the middle of this century, sea level is going to rise by feet, and it's going to keep rising. And that's why it's different than a storm. A storm comes in and recedes, and a, a, a day later you can start rebuilding. Sea level won't recede for a thousand years, so it's totally different it will ex accentuate or, or um, exacerbate the effect of storms and extreme tides, but sea level rise is different because it gets to all lowlands behind the shoreline. It also goes up tidal rivers and uh, has a profound effect. And by the second half of the century, it's going to be a big deal. Well, the tipping point for sea level rise is the collapse of the ice sheets on Greenland or Antarctica. Greenland holds enough ice that when it melts entirely, sea level will rise about 24 feet. Antarctica is about seven times that, or about 185 feet. And there's no way of exactly predicting that'll, how that'll happen, just like you can't predict an avalanche very well, you can't predict an earthquake exactly when it's gonna happen. We do know, though, because that there's miles of ice, we can measure it, and we can see that it's melting faster and faster. So the tipping point is when we have a collapse, just like an avalanche collapsing. Uh, again, there's we can know the potential is there. We won't know exactly when it's going to start. But that tipping point is when a certain set of glaciers in Antarctica, we know them, the Pine Island glaciers, the Thwaites, the, the, the Pine and Smith, etc. There's six glaciers, and they hold enough ice to raise sea level 10 feet, 3 meters. Uh, it won't happen overnight. It may take a decade, might take three decades. And it won't start for at least 20 years, because right now it's being restrained by what's called a grounding line. The glacier's hitting uh, a rock, and it, but as the glacier melts, it's going to clear the rock in about 20 years. And gravity means that this 100 miles or so of icy river, the glacier, is going to slide into the ocean, just a matter of when. Now, because we don't know whether it'll happen by the year 2100, most scientists leave it out of their estimates, because it's an uncertainty, as they call it. But here's the dilemma. 
that we measured it, we know it's melting faster and faster. We know that it has to slide into the ocean, that gravity dictates that, and that we're going to get 10 feet of sea level rise from those six glaciers, and there's another one that's going to cause 20 feet of sea level rise that's now started to move. So we are going to get a tipping point. Whether it happens in 2060 or 2160, we'll have to wait and see. Methane is the real ticking time bomb. Just like the tipping point of the collapse of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets, methane's the other big thing that we cannot predict. Methane is locked in the permafrost, in the tundra as you call it, um, and also in the seabed. There's a slush, like a snow cone slush, just underneath the seabed called methane uh, clathrates or hydrates. And this slush holds a tremendous amount of methane, which is far more potent than carbon dioxide and it's already starting to bubble up. There's lakes in Siberia and areas off uh, in the Arctic Ocean where it's just coming up like, looks like uh, carbonated water, like a carbonated beverage. And it's being trapped under the ice sheets during the Siberian lakes. So it's happening, we know it's gonna happen, uh, but again, we can't quantify it exactly because it will get worse as the planet warms and it's happening. It's huge, potentially. It's hard to say whether it will get bad within 50 years or 350 years. But it's again something we can measure. There's no doubt about it. It's simple physics. It's just a matter of when does it get to that exact temperature critical point where it comes out of the, the ice and, and uh, becomes gaseous. And that will greatly accelerate the warming, which is a feedback loop because as methane warms the planet, the warmer planet allows more methane to be released. London is a, on a tidal river. People don't think of that. So is Washington, D.C., so is Sacramento, California, and Hartford, Connecticut, and lots of cities that are quite far inland. And London is already having difficulty. You know, it was the storm in 1953 that was a devastating storm in London, and also in the Netherlands, that caused the, the Dutch to build a coastal defense system they have today, when, when uh, a huge North Sea storm devastated both countries. But just this winter, we're in 2015, a couple of months ago, London had severe flooding in downtown London, even though they have the barrage that's there to try and control the floodwaters, they were caught because they had waters coming down river that they wanted to stop, and yet water was coming up from the ocean, up the Thames, and um, it put water over the bulkheads to kind of a record high mark, and that's already happening. And as sea level rises, it's just gonna make that even worse. It's hard to calculate the cost of sea level rise. I mean, there have been some estimates, but I think it's so profound. I mean, what is the cost of Miami? What is the cost of uh, a city, whether it be the Maldives? What is the, what is the impact of parts of the Bahamas about, uh, you know, but it's from Manila to Monaco. It's from Bahamas to Bangladesh, using just the, the literal letters. But this is all over the world, from Singapore to Shanghai. Uh, that. San Francisco Bay, not even on the ocean, is having problems with king tides. Uh, Annapolis, Maryland, Boston, it's all over the world. So it's hard to calculate the cost because how high and what is the indirect cost? You can calculate the value of the property put underwater, but what's the value of the economy that's lost? What are the knock-on effects, as it were, that once you put certain neighborhoods underwater, what does that do to depressing the surrounding values when you lose a major city? I don't know that it's economically possible to come up with a number. People will try. But when people say it's going to be very expensive to get off fossil fuels, like, you know, what's the cost of getting off coal as a cheap energy source? I say, well, what's the cost of moving all coastal cities inland? We're elevating them. I, I bring it down to two things. Um, what we need to do about this climate crisis is two things. One is we need to begin adapting because a fair amount of this is now in the pipeline. It's unstoppable. And that may be unfortunate, maybe not what we want to hear, but the truth is even if we went 100% solar today, never burned another drop of fossil fuel and increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, even if we were 100% successful, that sea level is still going to rise. So it's a prime example of saying that you know, we need to begin preparing for that for the first time in human civilization, that sea level will be higher and the shorelines will move inland. Now some places we can build levees like in the Netherlands, but in South Florida or the Bahamas, it's porous limestone and sea walls won't work. Uh, you can't keep the water out, you can only elevate. So, and you can't elevate the Everglades, you can't elevate most of Florida. 
so different places require different solutions. We need to adapt to rising sea level and changing climate. We also need to do all we can to slow it. And the best way to slow it is to put some kind of a price on carbon. The various efforts to uh, put a cost to carbon so that it has an, an effect just like smoking cigarettes causes cancer and we attribute cost to that now and tax it. We need to make it more expensive to burn coal than it is to produce solar energy and other renewable forms. And that's a policy change and it needs to be international. There needs to be a global standard for an escalating cost to putting carbon in the atmosphere over time so people can plan for it and adapt to it. Now how to do that, whether that's by a tax or whether by a cap and dividend, fee and, uh, fee and rebate, there's lots of schemes and that's not my expertise. But I know there needs to be an economic disincentive to putting more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because the cost of it on our real estate, on our communities, on our homes, on our economies, on nations is probably incalculable. Well, it's an interesting idea that could you tax methane? I mean, I guess you could tax cattle uh, for dairy or meat and on the theory that they emit methane, which they do. The problem is the biggest source of methane is beyond our control. It's what's the methane that's in the seabed and the permafrost and the tundra. And we have no impact or ability to control that. So the source we do control, which would be farming and, um, well, the natural gas operations, fracking can often emit methane as unburnt natural gas, which is methane basically. Uh, we could tax that as a way to disincentivize that because methane is a potent greenhouse gas. But we have to recognize that the biggest risk is beyond our, our physical control. I think most governments today, and particularly in the last few years, have come to realize just how profound and how much of a game changer this is, climate change, that everything's going to change from not only real estate with the shoreline and sea level, but agriculture and fresh water supplies, drought, flooding rains, monsoons, and other places. Um, this is going to change everything. It's going to change what parts of the planet are usable. I think governments are trying to get the word out, but it is such a slow change, and it's so disruptive that we have to be, find the, the right mix between getting people's attention and not scaring them into depression and, and like we call deer in the headlights, being frozen you know, to inaction. And that's really a challenge. The other problem is that the real impact just gets worse and worse by the decade. And if, taking sea level for an example, my particular focal subject, is if it's not going to be bad, really bad, for 20 or 30 years, how big a problem is that for us today? And yet, because it's unstoppable, and when people realize what's ahead, we're going to start discounting the value of coastal properties, we can make a case that we should look at this more futuristically. And, but the governments haven't told that story yet. But I think they're trying. And I think they're trying to get people to adapt policy changes that will allow us to cap greenhouse gases and cap the warming to 2 degrees Celsius or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. But as we know, that's a struggle. Now, there's been some great news in 2015 about national cooperation. And there will be the Paris climate talks at the end of this year. And hopefully we'll set a good goal. But even if we achieve that goal, we're going to get sea level rise. Well, I think industry has a huge effect on government decisions, in our opinion. And the truth is, but I actually look at it as a glass half full. I think they're also a great potential source for change. And some industry has actually gotten the message. Um, most industry says, I just need to know what the rules are. Make sure it's a level playing field, that all sides have the same interests. Even if you're in the coal industry, if there's a tax on coal, they just want to know what that's going to be so that they can price it into their plans for the next 20, 30 years for capital investment. And that's fine. And I think we actually need to begin taking that longer term view and to say, we're going to price carbon and it's going to go up so much a ton every year for the rest of the century so that people can plan. And once people know that, that everybody has to play by the same rules, they actually will adopt. It's like standards for uh, automobile fuel efficiency or things like that. If you, if you know that everybody has to play by it, industry's fine. It's just that without rules, without a price on carbon, the incentive is to make as much money for their shareholders as possible. And that's not bad because most of it, for most of us, that's part of our retirements. But so industry really just wants to know what the rules are.
their temptation is to push it as far as they can. But that's where good leadership politically needs, needs an informed electorate. And I think we're on the process to do that. And this is part of that. So thank you. I think they're great opportunities because I think we have to get to people in their area of interest. And I think that people who look holistically at their health, their bodies, their communities, environmental health, are generally speaking very open-minded and very, I would say, a prime audience to consider the bigger picture. And what I tried to do today, and I think I was effective, was to say that just as you look holistically at your body in terms of food and exercise and um, the things which determine your health and how you deal with disease, we need to tie that into the planet because the planet's kind of the same holistic system. And of course, one affects the other. And often, we may tend to think that if we just get off of meat and uh, exercise and eat better, that everything will be well in the world. Well, to some degree, that will help. But we need to be realistic here again. Where are we living? Are our communities vulnerable to sea level rise? Is the change in temperature going to affect crops, affect water availability? and to, to see things holistically, just like we do with our bodies. So I think that this is a great audience to introduce this holistic thinking for the planet, looking at population, looking at how we make energy, um, look at our options to reduce greenhouse gases, and where we want to live, and where our kids are going to live, where our grandkids are going to live. Well, the, by the latter part of the century, the 2060s, 2070s, I think it's going to be a different planet. I think that we uh, will have more awareness. I think there'll be more people thinking holistically. There'll be people thinking healthier, but unfortunately we're going to have 9 billion people. There's going to be a lot of uh, political and, and uh, social, governmental security challenges because there's going to be a lot of land that's going to be underwater already. Bangladesh, Vietnam, the Maldives, Bahamas, etc. A lot of it will be gone. And, uh, the, that's going to change people's perception of the world. We've always assumed the shoreline was the shoreline, uh, but it, so it becomes a very good portal through which to look at things. But temperature will be changing, weather patterns will be changing, food supply will be changing. Uh, so I think we're going to go through a tough learning curve, but we've done that before. Humans do that very well. And I, sometimes to, to get to the end of the, the tunnel, to, you know, or to get through the storm, you, you may have to see the, the brighter day ahead, but you realize that, that we have to do some work here. And um, it's not all going to be green and, or rosy and perfect. Uh, but it starts with enlightenment. It starts with understanding. And the people who do want to chart a course and, and support good political leadership, good corporate leadership, and in the nonprofit world as well.